Over the past four years, we have brought together over 2,000 people to voice their visions for the future of North Lake. It has often been said that you cannot know where you are or where you are going if you do not know where you have been. At our annual meeting in June 2003, through the cooperation of the DeKalb Historical Society, we were privileged to partake of the treasured expertise of the official resident historian of DeKalb County, Walter P. McCurdy, Jr. We invite you now to take a visit to the past as Mr. McCurdy shares his knowledge of North Lake and passion for its history. Please enjoy with us his enthusiasm, humor, and lively spirit. I'm just going to sit back. I'm not really as old as I look. I woke up about three days ago with a crick in my back, and I look like I'm 98 and a half, but I feel fine, and I look forward to talking with y'all because I have, as you will find out, been in this area since the beginning of time. And what I've decided to do tonight, if it's all right with you, oh, by the way, when I first talked, uh, I talked to he said, said, how much time? And he said, much as you need. Now, that's dangerous because when you take a Baptist retired lawyer that loves history, and I'd be here all night long. And so I promise you that uh, I will be uh, uh, brief, 30 minutes at the most, 50, because I want to leave time for questions. So what I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit about DeKalb County's general history, beginning way back to the beginning Go bring it up just through the 19th and early 20th centuries, because I understand that y'all have heard a lot of good news about the present, so I'll just do this because I think it's fascinating. I think it's fun, and I, I enjoy it. When I was named... A little bit like that, okay? Right. Uh, that way? Is that better? County historian, my little granddaughter, I think hit it on the head better than anybody else as to what it takes to be a county historian. She had just turned four when Liana was kind enough to name me as the county historian. How's that? And we were walking out and I said that she was trying to understand what a county historian was. And in explaining it to her, her little eyes all of a sudden lit up and said, oh yes, granddaddy, you ought to be a county historian. You're the only person that's always been here. Which there's a lot of truth to that, so that's probably one qualification. The other is that where Jenny and I live uh, a small is a small piece of some property that my four-time great-granddaddy bought in 1828. So we have been around here now for eight generations. I don't know how many other folks have been here quite that long. What I think I'll do is, is to begin in the beginning, 18 and 20, on the west end of Georgia was Creek Indian or Cherokee Indian territory. This happened to be Creek. The United States entered into a treaty with the Creek Indian Nation in 1821 to cede a large piece of land from what's the north end of DeKalb County all the way down to Cordell. Ran down the Chattahoochee River and east about the same parallel. And I read the uh, agreement that was entered into, I'm going to sit back, is this all right? with the Creek Indian, and after they went through the whole thing they had on the bottom, and the United States government will never again ask of the Creek Indian nations another inch of their land so long as the sun shall rise or the moon shall set. And of course it took them about three more years to get the rest of the poor Indian territory. So we have this large piece of land, but what do we do? We luckily on the west end of Georgia are under what we call the land lottery system. You send in a, a, a person, a surveyor, to lay it out in the 3,000-foot squares. That's called a landlot. You're in landlot 209, the districts, about three districts in DeKalb, of the 18th district. To show you how far back some of the names that we've got now, when the surveyor, a fellow by the name of James Diamond, was running the line, he jumped across a creek in what is now DeKalb County, broke his finger, called it Snap Finger Creek, and it's been Snap Finger Creek ever since. 
So you see some of our names, and that's what I'm going to try to share with you all tonight, is where some of our names do come from, have been with us for a very long time. The next thing we need to do is take this big piece of land and divide it up into counties, and the county in which we were involved was Henry County. Henry County originally in 1821 consisted of Henry County, a little bit of Gwinnett, Decatur, and Fulton. It took them only about nine months to see that that was too big for somebody to get to the county site. And so in December of 1822, DeKalb County was set up for Henry, and that's where we came. That's when we came. How many of y'all know who Baron DeKalb was? Very good, because it's uh, something I think all of us should. Baron de Kapp was a Polish uh, gentleman that moved to France prior to the War of Revolution, Revolutionary War, and he had one thing going for him. He was six foot seven, and the French wanted tall people in the army, so they got him. And he came over here and he fought during the Revolutionary War until 1778. He was at the Battle of Camden, and he said he shouldn't go into it. They shouldn't go into it. It was a disastrous defeat. He was shot 13 times before he died. And the British were so impressed that they were, he was the only soldier that they buried in a British military funeral. So we named the Cab County after him. What do you need next? You need a county site, not seat. I always thought it was county seat until very recently. You want to choose a county site that is in the middle of your county and think about the cab, which also included what is now Fulton County. Fulton County is our kid. All of their original deeds were in or are in the DeKalb County Courthouse. So Decatur was chosen as a central site. If you think about it, there's a triangle putting the two counties together and Decatur would be in the middle. So you've got Decatur, and does anybody know who Decatur was? Stephen Decatur. Besides Barbara, who knows more than I do about it. He was a, uh, an admiral in the War of 1812, but he was a hot-headed fella and got into a duel and got shot right before we named our county site. And so we and 26 other cities in the United States named themselves Decatur. So we're not unique, but we were the county site. Now, what's the next thing you need? You need a way to get there. And so roads were laid out. First road, the roads that we'll be interested in, was Claremont. Now, I say Claremont because it's been changed six times. It started off as the road to the shallow ford over the Chattahoochee River. And if you think about Claremont, it's right exactly where it is now if you take off on shallow Road. Now, the way it got its name is right fascinating. It went through Peachtree, it went through Wind Drive, it went through five names until about 1891. Does anybody know where Decatur's YMCA is? Right outside Decatur. Well, on that hill lived a very beautiful young lady named Claire Ridley, who was the great aunt of Peer Howard, who was our lieutenant governor recently. Now, my daddy and uncle tell me this, and I imagine it's true. They said that she was so uh, attractive that the young men in Decatur started going out to visit Miss Claire, and it became jokingly known as the Road to Claire's Mount. Then it became Claremont, and it's been that ever since, except apparently Miss Claire didn't know how to spell her name because it's C-L-A-I-R in one part and C-L-A-R-E in the other. But that was Claremont. The next one that we would be interested in is Lawrenceville, the road from Decatur to Lawrenceville. The next one was the road from Decatur to the Rock Ridge over the Yellow River. That's Rock Ridge Road right out there. And those roads basically are the ones that we in this area are interested in. They had Covington Road, McDonough, Road to Fayetteville, but why didn't they have a road to Atlanta? Anybody got a guess? Atlanta wasn't there. We were there for 23 years before Atlanta even got thought of. I mean, they're a kid compared to us. Next thing we had was our institutions and the churches came in very early. Macedonia Primitive Baptist Church is the earliest church in DeKalb County, 1823, and it's still down near Lithonia. Now, the next church, I used to say, was the Decatur Presbyterian, 1824. But I made that talk when I was very young, 
and a gentleman in the audience named John Wesley Weeks said, no, it was the Decatur Methodist Church. Now, you can guess who John Wesley Weeks, what he might have been. I did the only thing I knew at that young age, and that was called Franklin Garrett. Oh, by the way, how many of y'all knew or have heard who Franklin Garrett is? That's great. I want to very quickly say that I don't even have the ability to be his water boy in the major leagues. There's nobody in the world that knows history anything like Franklin Garrett did. And old Franklin, I called him up and he says, best I can tell is the Methodist Presbyterian Church came upon the same week. So I assumed that they were pretty close to the same age. But I loved history way back and in the 1950s, I was, this, this gives you an idea of the kind of brain that he had. He did nothing but history. He's the Atlanta historian. Wrote Atlanta and its environment. It's 3,870 pages. If anybody sneezed at Atlanta, Franklin made note of it. And the only thing I can brag about is I've read it twice. But Franklin was on the radio on a Stump Franklin Garrett program. And I was listening, just a teenager, and the question was asked to him, when Macy's now, Davidson Paxson back in those days, came to Atlanta, they had, this 1926, they had a fascinating doorman. What was his name? And you heard this very quiet, I thought maybe they got him. He said on the left side of the door or the right. He knew both of them, and they were. That was Franklin Gary. And I do, I'm really honored to have been a close friend of his for some 40 years. He kind of took me through history. The next thing after your roads, your churches, by the way, I left out the Baptist, being a Baptist. The first Baptist church that we had in this area was the Hardeman Primitive Baptist Church. Now, if you go out Claremont from Decatur, you go under the railroad intersection right outside Decatur, and they used to have the University Court Apartments on your left. Well, right back in there, still in there, is the old Hardeman Baptist Church Cemetery. Because in 1839, the Baptists then just acted like, like the Baptists now. They got into a big fuss. We can't, that's good to make that. If you want to believe something, go be a join a Baptist church. You'll find one that agrees with you. But, and I'm a Baptist, I can say that. But they had a big argument as to whether or not to have Sunday school. Half the church said the Lord never went to Sunday school, so we won't go to Sunday school. The other half said, well, we'll learn more about him. So what did they do? They split. Half of them went out and started the Indian Creek Baptist Church. If y'all are familiar with where that is, Indian Creek Baptist Church started my church, Decatur First, in 1862. So the Baptists were there, but they were squabbling as far back as you can remember. Now, taking us on up into the 1830s, believe it or not, we have several families that were here or have been here for eight generations, like my family had. The first family that comes to my mind is the Candler family. How many of y'all know who Asa Candler is? Okay, Coca-Cola. I remember when, <laughs> this kind of reminds me of what I'm doing tonight. My daddy went to Emory two years after they opened. Emory was paid for by Asa Coca-Cola Candler and was, who was boss every move that he made by his brother Bishop Candler, who was the Methodist bishop who would have been a good holiness bishop nowadays. And when they opened it, they were interested, first of all, in your spiritual life, and second, they had to go to four of these, what do they call them, uh, where you gotta go and you hear a lecture on, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but be that as it may, you had to go to four of them a week, right. They didn't have any athletic programs, because that was not Christian. And the boys were asking, were asked to come up with a song for Emory, because they had no athletics. The song that made it out in a secret newspaper like you still have in high school sometime was one that a kid nobody knew who made up and it had several verses, but one of the verses was, we haven't got a football team that can go through Georgia's line. We haven't got a baseball team that can beat old Tex nine. But when it comes to slinging bull, I guess we can hold our own for if bull was only water, this would be a seaport town. And I sometimes wonder whether when I get up here that's what I'm doing, but I try not to. Now you got in this area, probably the most famous family that moved in, in the 1820s was the Henderson family. Grenville Henderson. 
He was a fascinating person. He had a large farm right out where Midvale and Henderson meet, if you're familiar with that area. He had the best peach brandy in the South. He was, he had four sons, and each of them ended up with a cemetery in addition to Grenville Cemetery. There's one right across the street here. If you go down to Augusta, you look and you see that uh, the, the, the cemetery is sitting right there, and that was the, the Henderson family. Another couple of families that lived out here on Lawrenceville Highway was the John Cash family and the Thomas Carter family. After the war, when they lost everything, they moved to Arkansas together. Johnny Cash, June Carter. See, we've got a lot of real well-known folks that came out of the Cab County. My great-great-great-great-granddaddy that bought the property where I'm living now, by the way, he paid 88 cents an acre for it because it was too stony, uh, was part of that Carter family. So by some way or another, I'm kin to I don't seem like him, but I'm kin to him. You had those two families. You had the Shooting family that lived out here on Lawrenceville Highway. You've got Shooting Road. One of the most fa uh, fascinating folks, and by the way, I'm not going to talk past the war between the states, so don't worry about it, uh, was John J. Johns. Johns Road. Any of you familiar with where Johns Road is? Because he owned about 416 acres out there, and he gave first in 1853 the acreage for a school which he quickly turned to a church and that's where we get uh get the uh i just dare to get old come on give me a help right over 285 on marshall highway reverend vice was the preacher uh, uh hey okay i just blank head up here but it later on became the largest Sunday school in the state. Huge church that we have. That was started in 54. The Old Grove Baptist Church was another old church that we have up here. Now the 1840s came along and we had what I consider to be the most important single developmental factor in our history. And that was the coming of the railroad. Now this came in a way that where I found uh, history fascinating. If little T nice things had not happened in just the right order, nothing would be like it is today. That's so obvious that you never think about it. The old joke that we used to have when a kid, country kid was asked, how did your mom and daddy meet? Cause the mule stepped on Uncle Billy's foot. How did that work? Well, my daddy had to take him to the doctor's office and my mama just, I mean, it went on and on, but this is the way the railroad got here because we had two factions in 1820s in Georgia. You had the Troop Faction and the Clark Faction. The Troop Faction being the hillbillies. Have you ever heard that term? Well, it was those that lived up here in the hills. The much richer faction was the one that lived on the coast. They wanted to put in another Erie Canal. That had been very popular in the 1820s and had been very uh, successful. And the hillbillies, the Clark faction, wanted to try the railroad, like they was just putting in in South Carolina, hadn't been invented by, by Watts, but about uh, 20 years. The votes were for the canal and against the railroad. However, on the date of the vote at Milledgeville, the capital, the horse bringing four of the people from Savannah to vote in favor of the canal broke its leg and fell in the creek and all of them had to swim out and they didn't make the vote and the railroad passed by two votes. That's how we got railroads instead of canals. So you see, if that horse hadn't broke his leg, we'd probably be floating in canals around here. But it was decided that we would have a terminus built somewhere up in the woods. They came to the people in Decatur in 1838 and said, how about y'all? being our terminus, because it had to be within a short distance of the Chattahoochee River. The people in Decatur said, we don't want any railroad. Think of all the sin and degradation. You know, we were worried about that in those days. Take it somewhere else. So they did. In 1842, they drove a terminus out in the woods where only one person lived, and that became Atlanta. Terminus, and then Marthasville, Martha Lumpkin, daughter of the Governor Lumpkin, and then Atlanta, and nobody's got a clue where Atlanta came from. 
They think it was named that because of Atlantis, was a big thing back in the 1840s, but they don't know. Right good name though, so they kept it. But they were told to build it within 18 miles, eight, yeah, 18 miles of the Chattahoochee, and so they were going to build it up by Norcross. They were going to put the drive to stake in at Norcross. They told the fellow that had the land that was going to sell it to them, we want to buy your land to put it there. Now, we're sitting here instead of Norcross for this reason. They went by, and he had been drunk the night before, and his wife took him out in the woods to sober him up. They couldn't find him. So they went somewhere else, and lo and behold, we got it down here instead of Norcross, which wasn't there then either. So you see, history to me is fascinating. You back up, why are you married to your wife now? Or your husband, as the case may be. Think about it. I mean, if you'd have gone somewhere else that night, you never would have met her. You might have met that other gal. Think what that would have been. Of course, I don't know that now. I won't say that thing. But anyway, history is this way. Everything happens because of little teeny things. In 1842, the three lines met, and for that reason, Atlanta was and became the central transportational hub of the South. Now, I'm going to jump forward because the war between the states is such an important, traumatic time in our history. I've been asked so many times about it that I want to try to cover it and then I'm going to let y'all ask any questions that you got. Interestingly, DeKalb was one of the 39% of the counties in Georgia to vote against secession. Everybody always thinks that the South was ready to jump in. It was a very close vote. One of the three people that went to vote for Georgia was, how many of y'all have heard of Scott Campbell? Good. When I was a boy, I thought you were born knowing Robert E. Lee Good Lord, and Scott Cameron, and I'm running into people that don't know him, but his great-granddaddy was a delegate to say, do not fight this war. He went up and lost. He got very sick before the vote took place. He told the people he was with, I do not want to live to see my country divided, and he died the day the war started, so he did not see it. Atlanta, though, the South, and Atlanta in particular, was devastated to a point that very few of us can imagine. Sherman came down from North Georgia through Mary, what's now Marietta, and the Battle of Atlanta, which is a misnomer, it ought to be the cab, started in July, by July the 18th of 1864. But you know, history's fun. That's the reason I enjoy it. I love talking to 10, 11, 12-year-old kids in class you have a blast in them. At that time, the, they were the, the, the Yanks and we were the Rebs. The Yanks were right on the other side of Chattahoochee River. The Rebs were on this side. Most of the boys were 16, 17, 18 years old at the fighting this war. And at night, they would go swimming together out in the middle of the river. And we found a letter. You talk about thinking fast. Both of them came up on an island laying out there. And we got to be buddies and got to talking. And, middle of the night, one of the uh, Yanks said, these gnats are awful. They're eating it alive. How do y'all stand it? One of them said, well, you don't have any gnat bomb on you. And the boy being from Vermont said, what's gnat bomb? He said, see that little vine there? It's got three leaves, got a little red center. Said, just get all you need, rub it all over you, take it back to your friends, tell them that you won't be bothered by the gnats. Now, we don't know exactly what happened after that, but we may have cut out a couple of anchors in the middle. But anyway, they crossed over the river and had the first of three battles, and that was the, the Battle of Peace Tree Creek. And it was more or less a draw, but the Southern Army had to pull back. That night, when the Northern Army thought that the Southern Army had gone back into Atlanta, they came right through where we are. They came down Hendersonville, what's now Hendersonville, Henderson Road to Stone Mountain, and they came up the railroad track, and the Southern Army had gotten about halfway here, and it sent Wheeler's cavalry on up, and he made it. The other half was supposed to go through what's East Lake. But at the time, it was a big swamp, and like generals often were, he would not believe his guide, whose great-grandson is a good friend of mine, who told him, don't go through there. And the half the Confederate Army got bogged down, and were about four hours late, getting there because Wheeler had won the battle in Decatur. He had driven the Northern Army out almost to where we are, Claremont, this area, but he had to pull back 
and the big battle was fought just about where the Jimmy Carter cell is. The Cab Avenue, all that area in there. Now let me give you some statistics that I myself put together. There was one unit that came out of Decatur that had 198, basically 200 boys in it that had John Y. Flowers, Flowers Road out here where uh, the University, Merchant University is. He was the head of this particular unit. They fought through the whole war. 53 of them were killed. 56 of them died of disease. Of the remaining 78, 44 of them lost an arm, a leg, or an eye, which means basically only 20-something came back <clears throat> in one piece. Of the 44 fathers of children less than 10 years old, 53% were killed. Now, this is here. It's right here in Decatur. So, when you figure that the Northern Army lost 1.6 soldiers for every one soldier that we lost, and combined we lost, the both armies lost three times as many men as in every other war we've been in combined. That was an awful war. And it was so unnecessary. One good thing came out of it, of course, and that's the institution of slavery it was in. But for 70 years, the South was devastated. It was 1941 before the last punitive tariff was taken off the books. Now, you know, every other war after that, we beat them and then we financed them and they came out in better shape than we did. That war it was backwards. But it still has some funny things that happened. Swanton House, have any of y'all been to Swanton House in Decatur? Well, all the ladies, you know, if the ladies had fought and not the men, we may have won the war, but all the ladies and the old men and the little children went into the Swanton House when the battle went through. And about three weeks after it, the Northerners sometimes were bad to borrow things and not bring them back. A Northern soldier who wrote about this in letters because he was in the Swanton wedding in 1894, went to the front door and demanded the silver, which they told him was gone, but he said, I know it's here, and so they finally said, well, you're right. It's up in the attic. Now, those are one of those attics where they pull open a trap door, and in his greed, this northern soldier ran up the attic, up the ladder to the attic, those ladies pulled it out from under him, and they had him a yank. Well, it was hot, July the 26th, just about here, and so the, the, the northern gentleman said, Will you wash my clothes after three or four days? And then they feed me through a hole in the side, and they said, certainly. And he handed his clothes down, and they burned his clothes. <laughs> so they had a naked Yankee. And about three weeks after that, finally, Sherman, I mean, the Wheeler's troops came back through, and they surrendered him with a towel around him. And he said he had to be the most embarrassed soldier in either side <laughs> to be surrendered by those gals. But it was... You have to find some levity because it, it's so bad. Now, I'll end up by telling my family, well, four boys in my family, my great-granddaddy, his younger two brothers, and his oldest brother, the oldest boy was 22. They all went off to war. One of them was killed in, in we believe, Spotsylvania. He's buried in, at 19 years old in Virginia. The 18-year-old never came home. We don't know where he was. My great-grandfather was shot in the spine, he never walked again. And his older brother had his arm and leg shot off. But even though he lost it, he still went back and was fighting at the Apple Battle of Appomattox. And when they, Lee surrendered, he tried to go off with Kent's Raiders to continue the battle. They said he couldn't hop fast enough. But we only had two come back and they were torn up. But my great-grandfather laying down on that field said, if good Lord told the Lord, he wasn't religious up to then, you get religion or something like that, said, if good Lord ever let him get back to Stone Mountain, because that's where all the Curtis came from. He pulled up the mountain and we ran out from under it, said, I'll carry your word. And he was the preacher at First Baptist Church there for 46 years. So he did that. But I'll end up by telling him about a letter, which I think is cute and you'll enjoy it, because this. In 1874, he had his little church right out here on Hugh Howell. I can throw a rock from my house to it, right off, uh, off of Hugh Howell. And uh, 
we got a letter that one of his church members wrote him asking, was it all right to take the Lord's Supper with a non-member of our church? You know, we Baptists get uptight about things like that. He wrote back a letter to this person and he says, it's fine to take the Lord's Supper with any person that calls upon the name of our Lord, except for Yankees and Republicans. And we've still got that. And if he went through there now, we've got everybody's Yankees and Republicans, and they're a good bunch of folks, you know. He might, might have agreed to it. But does anybody have a question? I didn't, I want to take more time, because I, I don't know if there's any question on the camp's history that, that anybody might want to ask. Well, folks, I have enjoyed, y'all, yes, ma'am, what you want? Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed being with you. I see so many people now that I know out there, because I can't see that good until I zero in on you, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Let me throw out a little thing. You've got one of the best historical societies in the country right here. I'm a member. I'm a volunteer, so I can say something like this. Both of these folks here, Vernon Jones and Leonard Levitan, have helped us tremendously. What we need is more of y'all. All you got to do is call up the historical society. We'd love to have you join. And I do appreciate the chance to be here with you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the DeKalb History Center. I'm Sue Ellen Owens, Executive Director. I've been here since 1993. Here at the DeKalb History Center, which is housed in the old courthouse on the square in downtown Decatur, we have a six-room museum with many, many collection items related to DeKalb's history. We have an archives and a research library. In our archives collection, we have photographs, personal papers, family history, all sorts of items documenting our county's history. We're very proud of DeKalb's history. We'd love for you to join us in our efforts to support the DeKalb Historical Society, the DeKalb History Center, as we keep our local history. We are supported through support donations, through corporate donations, and through the ability to, re to rent our lovely facility, the old courthouse on the square. If you visit our website at www.decabhistory.org, you can find what our support levels are and how to join. You may join online with your credit card or you can mail your membership to DeKalb History Center, 101 East Court Square, Decatur, Georgia, 330. If you need to talk to somebody about what we do here or about joining, you can call us at 404-373-1088. We've been keeping history here since 1947. Your memories are our history. Please join us in keeping your memories and keeping our history.